What if you knew I was telling the truth and I looked out at you and said, you cannot be saved from your sins? What would you think about that? Well, what would you think about the very fact, if it were a fact, that you couldn't be saved from your sins? We hear so much, and rightly so, about the Lord's love for us. The song we just participated in was echoing those sentiments. About his care for us, his desire for us to be saved from our sins, his desire for us to be with him in heaven. All these things said one way or the other time and time again as you go throughout the scriptures. and How many sermons are preached urging people to comply with the Lord's will so they can be saved from their sins, that they can become Christians. But there are some people that cannot be saved. Yet we read, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3.16 and the great apostle Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 2 and verse 4 that God will have all men to come into the knowledge of the truth. And why? Well, at the beginning of that, he said he would have all men to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. So I could say, what if God said, you will never know the truth that will set you free? You will never understand what you have to understand, what you must understand, what it's imperative that you understand as far as salvation is concerned because you can't be saved. We all are mindful of what Peter wrote to Christians in 2 Peter 3 and verse 9, that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise to return, but that he's not willing that he should perish but that all should come to repentance. That's the latter part of the verse. Simply saying the only reason he hasn't come back is because he's giving men time to change. But what if those verses weren't there and verses expressing like sentiment, you can't be saved from your sins. There is no hope for you. There's certainly no lack of power in Jesus Christ to save sinners. The writer of Hebrews wrote it this way in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. He is able to save to the uttermost them that draw near unto him or unto God through him. But what if that wasn't real? What if there is no Savior? You know, if you're, you're saved, somebody has to do the saving. But there is no Savior. In spite of God's desire and all that he's done for us to save us from our sins, sacrifice of Christ, all those things, I say again, some people cannot be saved. Now, it's not God's fault, but it's where the fault always lies, and that is man's fault. I'm glad to announce and have for years that salvation is in Christ. The gospel is God's power to save, Romans 1.16. It's to be preached to every creature because God loves men and wants them to be saved. Thus, the power to save is preached to them, Mark 16.15. Point is, he doesn't force it on anyone. And we would do well since some cannot be saved to ask the question, who cannot? Who is not able to be saved? Well, the answer is really quite simple. The first one is very simple that I will give. Those who do not desire to be saved cannot be saved. See, we live in a world today that's more than ever not desiring salvation, not desiring anything pertaining to God, to Christ, to the Bible, to what it teaches. No interest whatsoever. None. And if a person has no interest in spiritual blessings coming only from God through the knowledge of God's Word, 
that person can't be saved. And there are some who do not. There has to be a reason that when back in 1950s on back, even into the 60s, and virtually the whole 19th century, you could reach people with the gospel. They cared about God. They cared about what the Bible taught. They may not have any books in their home, but they would have the Bible. They learned to read by the Bible. The Bible played an important point, a part of their lives. The ground was ready to receive the truth. You, did not, you didn't necessarily prove the existence of God, and I'm not saying it should have been. It should have been a lot more preaching on such as that, the deity of Christ, the inspiration of the scriptures. But I'm saying people were so anchored with that in their background in the culture that we were in that thus most of the preaching took place on, well, what is the plan of salvation? At what point does God forgive us of our sins? Who is a Christian? How do you identify a Christian? What's the relationship of the church to salvation, if any? And so on and so forth. But you see, as I said, I think last week, those things are only of interest to people who are already interested in God and godly things. Jesus taught in a parable in Matthew 21, 30, 33 through 46 about servants who had no appreciation for the blessings of the master that he had provided them. They took what he had provided them and used them for themselves. And in doing so, they neglected their obligations to their master. Well, when the Lord came back, their master required of them what he had given them. The scripture says he will miserably, he will, uh, miserably destroy those wicked men. He will miserably destroy those wicked men. Well, we live in a world that desires not to retain God in their knowledge, Romans 1, 28. Jude described them as filthy dreamers, defile the flesh, despise dominion. They live as brute beasts, Jude 8 through 10. These are the kind of people that Paul said in Romans 1, God gave them up to all those things they desired to do because they did not retain God in their knowledge. When we strive to reach people with the gospel today, we not only have to deal with the denominational errors that are all around us, but we have added to that, and it grows more by the day. All of these people who are so secular and materialistic, they have no interest in God, and they're strictly interested in the evil that's in this world, and the evil becomes that which is normal to them. I think one of the greatest monitors, uh, maybe uh, the way to put it, of just how wicked the world is, is to pick out a TV show here and there, <laughs> nearly anywhere here and now, <laughs> there. Especially I'm talking about the modern ones that are like this year's or this fall's new programs and for the last several years. And the stuff that goes on in those things grow more gross from year to year, more immoral, and the foul language that's used is... It makes what went on back in the early 70s now and then seem like, well, they didn't use bad language back then. And they seem to work as hard as they can to find the most gross sewer ditch language they possibly can to describe and then use it over and over again. What kind of people do that? People who are totally sold on this world, who live solely on the lust of the flesh, on that level, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. They have no interest in God. And thus, we have to live among them and keep the church, the Lord's church, and live each day a righteous life. Jesus is still saying to all of them, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. thing of it is, they don't recognize all that they're doing to keep God out of their knowledge as that which puts them under a laborious state and that they are heavy laden. They're encouraging all people to do those things, to live that way, to speak that way. But the invitation that the Lord gives is just an invitation. It's not an order. It doesn't force anyone to come to Him. And since we are the ones who deliver the gospel message, 
uh, we're not in the forcing business either. We're expected to live a godly life before the world, be the light of the world, the leavening influence for good. And that means we have to choose what we say. We're careful with our words, for by our words we'll be justified, and by our words we'll be condemned. So we're always mindful of setting a Christian example before all we're around. We must be looking for every opportunity, as we said recently, to say things that will change people or make them think. A lot of people just don't know to think a thing that they have something spur them to do it. We use that word spur, and that's rather interesting. And you know that when I use the word spur, we think of a rider using spurs. You can make a horse do a lot of things if you knew how to use spurs, if you train him with it, and I don't mean by hurting it. You can just send a signal to it and make that horse by teaching and training, mainly training, know what you want to do. That brings to mind the fact that we had a colt one time, and as he was growing up, we had to train him. He reminds me of a lot of people when we were training him to halter lead. We had a cotton halter so it would, he wouldn't hurt himself and put it on him and had a rope tied to it and tied him and the rope to the tree. For I don't know how long he sat back there and tried to pull that tree up by the roots. Now he couldn't do it. No way in the world he could do it. And to help him learn to lead better than this let him follow his mother. He would follow his mother into the fires of torment. That's just how animals are like that. But then there came the time when I, <laughs> this is when we put on the rodeo, there came the time when I wanted to help him in learning spurs. He had to be real careful. Because one day he threw me from about from here to that door back there when I applied the spurs to him. Well, spurs work. Not like I wanted him to work at that point, but later on that was different. I could get him to change gates and so forth by those spurs. But he had to learn. But what about us? What about us as influence for good on other people? Sometimes you have to spur other people on. We have to say some things. Where did I learn that? I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I read Jesus approaching people and how he would say things that must have made him made them People just say, what, what, did he say what I think he said? What, what did you hear him say? Just think of when some of his disciples left him because of hard sayings. And he just turned around and asked those that were still there, will you also go away? What would it take for me to say for cause you to leave like these folks did? Of course, this elicited from Peter, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of everlasting life. Until you can get people to see those things, then what good does it do to really work with them? There's a lot more to looking at the master teacher than, than just the information he imparted concerning what to do to be saved and how to live the Christian life. You can look at him and see how he got a hold of people's attention. And I don't think we notice that that much. But that's what we are. We're the spiritual body of Christ. Should we not incorporate the example of our head in being an influence for good in the world and dealing with people who have gone mad over sensual things? Sometimes it may take some pretty straight talk to just jar people up. So it's still up to each one of us to decide for ourselves and to try to get other people to see the importance of deciding. Uh, the challenge is still there as it was thousands of years ago when Joshua told the children of Israel, choose you this day whom you will serve. When's the last time you said that to somebody that's not a member of the church or a member of the church? You make the choice. Listen, you can go to hell if you want to. I don't have to go with you. We've got ourselves to the point in this nation and in the church for a good long time that if you say something like that to somebody, try to get them to think. 
on something they might never think about, that you're a bad guy. You're a crude person. That's just not the case. Paul called people like this carnal-minded, Romans 8, verse 6. Now, we most of the time today use the word carnal from the standpoint of uh, naked bodies and all such stuff as that. But carnal in its general usage, as Paul used it in Romans 8, 6, just means the, the affairs that are fleshly and, and physical and of time and space, and there's where your heart's located. So it doesn't just necessarily mean sexual sin or something like that. We have to get people to be interested in spiritual things, and people already know what spiritual is. Most people think it's an emotional thing. But being spiritual is just living like the Bible says. That's spiritual. You can't be any more spiritual than to live like the New Testament teaches you. Ask yourself the question, how can I be more spiritual than to live like the New Testament teaches me to live? You can't be. So we have to try to do things to make people realize the way you're living is not going to take you to heaven. Somebody says something or other, well, I believe I'm saved the moment I believe. Uh, I think a good question to a person like that is, where'd you learn that? Well, who told you that? Why do you think that? One of the hardest things in the world for all of us is to learn to think. Then there are those folks who trust in their own goodness. There are some people who are very proud of themselves. And they're proud of themselves because they just know they're the cat's meow. They're good. Daddy used to joke all the time. And it used to be something come up that would make him say this, but I can't think of one of them right now. But he would say, well, I'm not conceited. I'm pretty than what I think I am. You have to think about that a minute. Well, that's where a lot of folks are. I'm good, and I'll tell you about it. Don't you wish you were as good as I am? And I might say, I wish I was as good as you really think you are. <laughs> there has to be one, one thing about it. You know, we, the Lord, if anybody could call anybody good, you could call Jesus Christ good. But do you remember that rich young ruler that came to Jesus? Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He didn't give him the answer right away. You remember how I started? Why callest thou me good? There's but one good, and that's God. See, by implication, to call a man good, you're saying he's God in the case of what goodness is. And Jesus said, as you acknowledge me as God, are you really willing, really willing to follow what I'm about to tell you? And he told him, and he wasn't willing. You'll notice the pictures that the Lord gives us of the judgment. And those on the left, the goats, those pictured as those lost. Lord, Lord, have we not done many wonderful works in thy name? Now notice these are not atheists. They're not Hindus. They're not Buddhists. They're not Muslims. They're not secularists. They're calling him Lord, and they're saying we've done many wonderful things in his name. Well, what's his answer to him? Verses 22 and 23. I never knew you. Depart from me. It's always interesting to note that with every account there is of the judgment and people try to argue, the Lord doesn't argue with him, he just pronounces sentence. Well, the point is quite simple. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death, Jeremiah 10, 23. What they claimed, Lord, Lord, did we do many wonderful works in thy name? They hadn't. They had not done that. It's almost going back to our rich young ruler uh, he tells them what the commandment said. Have you ever noticed the response? These have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? And one account says, you lack one thing, Jesus said. 
He says, you go sell all you got and give it to poor and come and follow me. And, of course, he goes away sorrowful for he had great riches. He said that he had done everything. It's what you got to remember. Inspiration recorded what he said. That doesn't mean he had done it. The point then is a simple one. It's not in man that walketh to direct his own steps. That's the reason many people can't be saved and never will be saved. Isaiah said, the great messianic prophecy in chapter 64 and verse 6, all our righteousness are as filthy rags. We certainly can't save ourselves. We cannot come up with some sort of plan of salvation that the most righteous of us put together. We cannot guide ourselves alone. What we call good works will not save us by themselves. Things that we think are all right. Every picture of the judgment for lost people makes that clear. We trust too much in ourselves. Somebody will say, well, I don't see any need of of attending services or whatever. Uh, I'm living a good life. But just living a good, as most people will say, a moral life is not going to save anybody. A person must obey the gospel of Christ. And that's the point. When we become quite full of pride and puffed up in our goodness, we need to go back and read a lot of the Bible that deals on humility and meekness and how we cannot save ourselves. The Lord put it all in perspective in Luke 17, 10. When ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. Is there a message there for us? What does he want us to learn? What is that telling me about myself? One lived in flawless, perfect obedience. He's only done what God created him to do in the first place. What's that to brag about? Thus, no reward is due over that. Yet so many are rejecting the gospel plan of salvation offered in Christ. Well, I'm a good life. I live a good moral life. I believe that's all I have to do. I've had people tell me that. I live a good moral life. That's all I have to do. But it won't work. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23, and the wages of sin is death, separation from God, Romans 6.23. When we believe the truth of the gospel and from the heart obey it, Romans 6.17 and 18, Romans 6.3 and 4, we're trusting in Christ to save us, not ourselves. We're submitting to his will. It's a passive activity on our part in obedience to the truth. So he's the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Hebrews 5 and verse 10. There are those who refuse the gospel call, and yet they think they're saved, but they can't be saved. Jesus said in John chapter 6 and verse 44, No man can come to me except the Father which sent me draw him. And you'll remember in the book of Conversions, Acts 10, verse 34, how that Peter declares the household of Cornelius when he understands that all men everywhere can be saved. He says plainly, God is no respecter of persons. I have thought about this several times in the last few days, last week. Because like uh, all of us here, we've never known any monarch over in Great Britain but Queen Elizabeth II. And you think what a, well, I don't know that we can think that, what a radical, jarring change it was for her to step out of this life into the next. You know, she was the head of the Church of England. How would you like to come face to face with the Lord while you had lived all your life as virtually as the head of a church when he is the only head? 
He's the one that purchased with his blood. He's king of king and lord of lords. Why? King of kings and lord of lords. So what a radical change. And people who are in positions like that are not nearly as uh, influential positions she's been in. What a sad day of reckoning. The way God calls one person, he calls all people. God has chosen you from the beginning unto salvation and sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you through our gospel. 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 through 14. God calls everybody through the gospel of Christ and in no other way. We need to understand that the gospel is then the power of God unto salvation, Romans 1.16. Then there are those who know they've sinned, admit sin, and know it's transgression of the law. They're not going to turn from their sins. Sin's the only thing that separates us from God, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Nothing else. Sin's our greatest enemy. I don't know how many times we have to say that or the Bible has to tell us that before we believe it. But uh, cancer's not our greatest enemy. Heart attacks aren't our greatest enemy. Sin's our greatest enemy. The Lord came to this earth. He lived on this earth and he died so that we would leave the very practice of sin. Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 15, he died for all that they that live should no longer live unto themselves but unto him who for their sakes died and rose again. We truly don't belong to ourselves or any other human. Now notice then these passages are teaching us that Jesus died to save us from sin. Not to save us in sin. Paul pointed that out to the Roman Christians in Romans 6, 11 when he said that we're dead unto sin but alive unto God through Jesus Christ. So we see the importance of repentance. But if you don't think you need to repent, there's no way you to be saved. In his earthly ministry, he said to the Jews, Nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish, Luke 13, 3. In Acts 17, 30, he says that he commands all men everywhere to repent. Well, repentance means on my part that I recognize the sins of my life and the kind of life I've been living, and I can't live that way anymore. I must live like the New Testament teaches. So he says, if any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me, Matthew 16, 24. There's where really the whole thing comes down to to the brass tacks. Let him deny himself. That's not an easy thing to do. If I'm so determined to do things my way, to have things my way, and live as I want to live, then I cannot be saved. It's an impossibility. So over and over again, Old and New Testament, repent. Repent. But those who are determined to live in sin, to practice sin, they cannot be saved. Then those who reject the death of Jesus Christ and why he died. The penalty for sin is clearly stated in God's word. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Then he goes ahead to say, the wages of sin is death. Then he said, sin, when it's full grown, bringeth forth death. Ezekiel 18, 20, Romans 6 and 23, and James 1, verse 15. But God sent his son to die for us, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Hebrews 2, 9. He died on the cross for us. The hate of sin being destroyed what did he do for those of us who believe and from the heart obey the gospel? Well, having made peace through the blood of his cross, Colossians 1.20, we find peace with God and obedience of the gospel. For when we're baptized into Christ, we're baptized into his death. It was in his death where he shed his blood. 
Anyone who rejects the death of Christ cannot be saved. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. Romans 3, 23-25. People can talk about it being barbaric. To talk about blood being involved, especially the blood of a man, of Christ. But life is in the blood. And even to this day, people will talk about the shedding of blood indicative of a person's love for somebody else when they die protecting them. But we must conform to the image of our God's Son, our Savior, Romans 8, 29. Thus, when we understand the death and the blood of Christ shed in His death, Romans 3.25, God states in Romans 5, verses 8 through 10, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. If you come on down through that passage, several verses later, about 14, you'll find this, which we're very familiar with. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? That like as Christ was, um, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was uh, raised from the dead, up from the dead by the glory of the Father. Even so we also should walk in newness of life. Romans 6, 3 and 4. As a mouthful said in those few words. Christ died, shed his blood for us. He was buried, he was raised from the dead the third day. These are all the facts that are basic to the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And if we are to be conformed to the image of His Son, then we must be baptized into His death, buried with Him by baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. And the newness of life cannot begin until we're baptized into Christ and into His death. For, to use the language of Scripture, if any man be in Christ, in Christ, he is a new creature. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And this is why that Paul wrote, Having been buried with him by baptism, wherein ye were also raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. Then he said, If then ye were raised together with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is. For ye died. And your life is hid with Christ in God. Colossians 2, 12, 13. Actually, it carries beyond that to Colossians 3 and verses 1 through 3. So those who reject the death of Christ as presented in the scriptures, they can't be saved. Well, people can be saved. But do you see them? We're saying it's conditional. We mentioned the conditions of salvation or the steps and the plan of salvation. The world doesn't want to acknowledge them. The world doesn't want to believe there is a plan of salvation. But the world will remain lost because it cannot be saved until it does. We won't continue to belabor the point, but you see what I mean when I said, what if God were to say you cannot be saved? It would have to be because you do not want to believe and comply with what God said one must believe and do in order to be saved from your sins. Well, I would simply ask in closing, if you're going to leave New Testament Christianity, there must be something better somewhere else. Well, I would just simply like to know what it is. So, to whom shall we go? Christ has the words of everlasting life, and we know and are sure that he is the Son of God. 
If you need to obey the gospel, we've taught how to do it. But if you want to obey the gospel, you can't be saved. As a child of God, you need to repent of sins, then you'll be forgiven of those sins if you'll repent of them and confess them. But if you won't repent of sins, you can't be saved. So we offer this invitation for anyone that needs to respond accordingly. So would you come if you need while we stand to sing?